Good morning, Helmer and Orland United Methodist Churches. It is not quite nine o'clock, but I'm getting all kinds of text from people who are having angst about getting connected. So I thought I would give you just a couple of extra minutes to um, figure out where this shows up in your feed. I think if you are friends with the Helmer United Methodist Church page that it will automatically pop up in your feed without having to do anything um, or you may have to go to the church page too so uh, feel free to hop on and we'll get started shortly um, yesterday fishing through Facebook I realized um, everybody just has too much time on their hands um, people are are doing things that they wouldn't normally do and I even considered cleaning my oven now I haven't done it yet, but um, boy, oh boy, it is nice to have the extra time, um, although I really haven't so much because of keeping up with things at the church and what have you, but a little extra time. And um, also, if you uh, are out and about today, uh, we happen to have a birthday boy in this house, um, and since there's only um, two male creatures and one has three legs and long gray hair, uh, you might guess that the other one will be two-legged and uh, has a beard. So if you're out and about and see Mike, um, we're going to make a big birthday trip later and do a drive through thing to get some ice cream, and that'll be it for this year, but that's okay. It'll be fun. So... Um, Looking forward to our time together this morning. It is almost 9 o'clock, so we will uh, go ahead and get started. I see a lot of people popping in here this morning, so welcome. Glad to have you and glad to share what God has laid on my heart today. So um, before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, on this beautiful sunny morning, we give you praise, honor, and glory. We know that nothing in this world happens that isn't of your design, and we are so grateful for that. So, Father, as we adjust ourselves to this new way of life for the next short time, help us to appreciate it. Help us that when this time is over that we don't uh, go back to whatever normal was again, how quickly we forget and we don't appreciate. And so, Father, I would this morning pray that uh, this would be a new start for us to focus on you with that extra time that we have, that we're focusing on your word, that we're focusing on your people, that we're focusing on those who desperately need to know you. So be with us during this time together. Be with each and every person out there and those that will see this later today. Um, we know, Father, that you are here with us. We sense your Holy Spirit in each and every home and wherever individuals or families are. We know that you're there. We pray it in your precious and your holy name. Amen. A few prayer requests to um, share with you this morning. And when I send this out, this link out later by email, I will also include our entire prayer list from our bulletin. Um, a lot of things, obviously, in the bulletin have shifted, and I'm not going to take those all out and uh, redo them all again. So when you get the bulletin, there will be some things that dates and what have you won't be appropriate, but at least you'll have the prayer list with it. But I especially would ask this morning that you would lift uh, Louise and Earl in prayer as she continues to be in the hospital. Um, just struggling with carrying fluid on her weak heart. So uh, pray God's mercies upon them and patience for Louise. She wants to go home, but that just isn't in the cards, at least as of yesterday. So praying that we get some news on that today. Um, also praying for Norman Bobby as he came home a couple days ago from work with a terrible cough and just can't seem to get that under control. So pray for him and Joanne as well. For a little lady uh, about uh, six, seven, eight years old named, uh, named Lyra or Lyra, L-Y-R-A, um, who's awaiting a liver transplant, a uh, huge financial burden for her family to make the travels that they need to make and um, just the not knowing. There's so many complications with it. And so we lift that family in prayer as well. 
also for Aunt Laverne. The family knows the situation there, and I've been asked to add her to our prayer list. And of course, ongoing, we pray for Kristen and her family as her chemo and radiation continues into the coming week, week for strength for those that are providing a variety of things for them. Um, thank you, Jesus, for hearts that reach out to others. We, we really, truly thank you for that. Um, I also would note that um, during this time, we're finding more and more people with a lot of hardships uh, getting laid off, getting cut back. Uh, there are some odd jobs out there, but sometimes that messes up unemployment and makes it worse than if you just take the cut and pay and take unemployment. So if you have a heart to help, uh, one of the best ways that I'm finding is with um, uh, gift cards. Uh, I would prefer them in $25 denominations from like Walmart or Meyer or Kroger, a common place where people can get both gas and get uh, some grocery supplies. And uh, if you have those, please um, message me or email me and um, I'll be glad to pick them up or meet you at the church or something. And, and then we'll uh, distribute those as the need arises as well. Um, also for utility bills that may get behind, uh, again, um, cash donations could be set aside in our benevolent fund and use for that as well during this time. And then also just once again, I mentioned this the other day if you saw my last video, but I continue to get questions about tithes and offerings. What do we do? Well, um, the reality is, is that we continue to have bills to pay for the church, for utilities and, and that sort of thing. And so I encourage you to continue to give as you normally would. Um, if you want to mail it to the church, do so. Uh, make the check payable to Helmer United Methodist Church or Orland United Methodist Church and um, mail those to the church addresses and the treasurers will get them. And that will uh, help us to continue on with our ministry and not come out with a huge hole in the end. Um, God tells us very specifically about giving and about being generous, and this is especially a time to do it. And I would know, you know, they're talking about this economic stimulus package. What a great time to give a little extra over what we normally do. Uh, what a great opportunity for those that are on a fixed income uh, who might just tuck this away in the bank, but maybe it's the time um, uh, to give a little extra to go for the kingdom's work. So uh, pray about that and consider that if you would. Okay. Uh, you might notice behind me my glass office door here at home. Critters moving back and forth because we have a two-year-old kitty and a one-year-old puppy and they are playing frantically running back and forth. So I could move and try, but you know, that's just life here at the Holcomb House. So welcome to our world. So um, today, uh, God has laid on my heart, you, you may remember um, a week ago when we were together, I mentioned that God had laid on my heart to preach from the book of Esther, and it's still really on my heart, but I want to do that when we're together face to face, and that would be probably a short series. So I began to pray about what he would want me to share with you um, on this Sunday morning online sermon. And as I flipped through my Bible and, and looked and considered and prayed as I laid my hand in various areas, he led me to an interesting little book that we don't normally uh, look at much, um, but in the bigger picture, it's huge, and I felt it was so timely for right now. And so uh, because of that, the title of my message this morning is a question, and it is, Who is in Control? And so um, if you look towards the end of the Old Testament in your Bible, get just before it starts at the New Testament, you're going to find a series of power-packed little books, three, four, five, six, seven little chapters in these books. Some of them are known. Some of them may be names that you've never heard of. Book of Jonah, for instance, everybody's heard of, you know, Jonah and the whale story, all that sort of thing. Um, there's Micah, there's Nahum, there's Zephaniah, there's, uh, depending on how you say it, I call it Haggai, um, Zechariah, Malachi, and several others, but tucked in the middle of all of those 
is a book with three little chapters written by a gentleman named Habakkuk. People say that differently. Uh, Habakkuk or Habba, 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 Habakkuk. I've heard people say, I've always said Habakkuk, so bear with me today on that. But his little book, three chapters long, his power pack buried right in the middle of those little books, right at the end um, of the uh, Old Testament. So here's a little bit about Habakkuk, in case you don't know about him. Uh, and I encourage you uh, after, later today when you've got some time to sit down, sit down and read Habakkuk. Three little chapters, not very long at all. You'll get the whole picture. I'm pulling some things a little out of context this morning. But when you read the whole thing, you'll understand how it is so applicable to what's going on in our world right now. So um, Habakkuk was a priest. Um, but he acted a lot more like a prophet. He prophesied a lot to the people uh, in the area that he was at. And I think it's safe to say that without a doubt, Habakkuk knew God, intimately knew God, had a wonderful, intimate relationship with God. He talked to God. He shared with God. He cried out to God. And most importantly, he listened for and to God. We have to admit, sometimes we go to that step and then we don't take that last step of just being still and listening for and to God. Well, the book of Habakkuk in its three little um, chapters is divided really into two parts. Uh, Habakkuk has complaints and complaints that he lodges with God. And then he has his prayers. So there's really complaints and prayers within this book. And even though his situation dealt with wars and all that goes with that, uh, takeovers of countries, famine, fear, etc., um, he was very concerned about the countries turning away from God, not turning back to God again. But the lesson behind it is as prevalent today as it was during the time that it was written, which is estimated between 588 and 612 BC before Christ. So a long time ago, the message is as prevalent today as it was then. So as a pastor, I'm often asked by people, why is it that good people suffer while evil people keep going on like nothing has ever happened. Doesn't seem like it makes a difference to them. They just keep doing naughty, nasty things and have no penalty. Why is it that happens? Or another question that I often get, and I know a lot of pastors do because I've had a lot of pastoral discussions, um, is why doesn't God answer my prayers? Or another one that often comes up is, I'm giving my best to the Lord, so why am I being treated so badly by others? I'm doing the best I can here, and yet it seems like every corner that I turn, I'm getting stepped on, stomped on, somebody's hanging on to the back of my shirt and won't let go, won't let me move forward. Why is that, and what's going on? Well, friends, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I'm here to tell you that we as Christians are not without problems. And I don't think that's a news flash for any of us today, right? In fact, many of us have experienced these phenomenons that once we've accepted Jesus, things seem to get worse. And we always wonder, why is that? Oftentimes people accept Jesus and they skip out of the church or skip out of the river or wherever it is that they are, that they've asked him to come into their heart, and then bam, the world hits them right upside of the head. And we wonder, why is that? Why would God cause that to happen or allow that to happen? Well, simply this, when we accept Christ, the evil one goes into overdrive. He goes into overtime. He is losing the battle again, one person at a time, accepting Christ into their life. And so um, he begins to plant seeds of doubt and fear that are even deeper than the ones that we already had. Anybody out there have any 
feelings of doubt or fear, um, lack of self-confidence, that sort of thing. Satan loves that because that's an opening for him to dig deeper and get a foothold and say, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Come on with me. Things were good before you accepted this Jesus. So come back. Come back to me. But we know that there's no turning back once we've accepted Christ. Um, it's sure discouraging when we accept Christ and we begin to notice that we are losing our focus and we feel like we're losing our faith because of all the things that the world is throwing at us. But, you know, when we face such struggles and such doubts in our life, um, we need to cry out to God. And then, as I said earlier, we need to do the really hard thing. We need to listen. It's easy to cry out to God. It's easy to shake your fist at God and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? It's okay. God's got broad shoulders. He can take it. In fact, I believe God loves it when we cry out to him, even if we are shaking our fist, because at least he knows that we're communicating with him. We're acknowledging his existence. The part that we often fail at is taking the time to listen for his response. In fact, I encourage you to not only listen for his response, but listen very carefully because oftentimes his response is very subtle. And we say, well, I didn't hear anything from God. My prayers weren't answered. He didn't talk back to me or give me any kind of a response. Well, friends, let's put that in the context of our present circumstances. Think about how many times that you have longed for some downtime, some time that you'd like to catch up on reading or housekeeping or repairs outdoors. Think of all the times that you've wished to find that kind of time. How many times have we thought in our head or even laughingly said out loud, Oh, if there was only one more day in the week or one more day in the weekend, right? We say that over and over again. And having the time to prepare a home-cooked meal, a healthy home-cooked meal. And what about the time to take a leisurely drive out in the country? Um, how often have we longed to get back to the good old days I hear people talk about that. Oh, yeah, mom, dad, and the kids pile in the car on Sunday afternoon. Just took a drive out through the country. How long has it been since you've done that? I know a few of you do it once in a while because I hear you talk about it, but not nearly like it used to be. You know, now a lot of times that kind of a drive would end up in visiting, and right now we're supposed to kind of avoid that sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that you can't hop in the car and just take a drive out through the country. Go sit on your porch, get some fresh air if it's nice. It's a little frosty this morning. Um, go out and take a walk if you're able to do that. But if nothing else, get in the car and take a little country drive and just recenter yourself now that you've got a little extra time to do that. What about checking on neighbors? making sure people have what they need. You may not be able to go get someone something they need, but you all know someone who can. And certainly Mike and I are on the top of that list, and there's many people listening right now that are on that list also that would be happy to make a grocery run or a pharmacy run or a dog food run or whatever it is. But check on someone. And I'm hearing a lot of that. I, I've tried to call Pretty much everybody, one way or the other, make a contact. And I've, I've heard from many people, oh, yeah, I've had three or four other people call me already. You guys are really good at that. But also make sure it's people not just in the churches but outside the churches. Check on your neighbors and make sure. I know a young man who um, lives in another state who's severely handicapped physically. And he lives in a, in a neighborhood, in a, a subdivision, I would say. And he, he was outside yesterday in his electric wheelchair for the first time in, since the beginning of the year. It's a little nicer weather where he lives. And he said in the three months since the first of the year, not one neighbor has checked on him during that time. Nobody stops by just to chat. 
He's bed bound a lot. Um, nobody um, calls anything. Um, and that just kind of breaks my heart. I, I think we're different people than that, but I encourage you to think about those that need us to reach out. And they may say they're fine, and they may say they don't need anything, and that's okay. But just knowing that someone cares enough to uh, give them a call and offer some help, send a card in the mail, whatever it is, I encourage you to do that. Check on each other. Um, just take that time to do it, because now we have the time to do that. Well, you know, when I think about all of this, maybe our prayers have been answered after all, because now we've got that magical gift of time. Um, maybe this forced quarantine that we're under is providing us some time to do all of those things that we haven't had time for, and even so much more. Uh, maybe all of this is an answer to prayer in a strange sort of way, but think about it, maybe it is, because God does have mysterious ways of answering prayer. Amen? <laughs> We've seen that many times. Well, if we go to our Bibles and turn to the book of Habakkuk, um, like I say, it's right, not quite the middle of your Bible, um, but it's right before the New Testament starts. And I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. Um, in my Bible... Uh, if I look at chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, it is subtitled Habakkuk's Complaint. Hmm. We don't do any complaining, do we? Yeah, if only. Habakkuk's Complaint is this, starting in verse 2. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the right, the wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Sounds like Habakkuk's pretty discouraged, and he's not very happy with God either, crying out to God in that and saying, what are you doing? So we need to ask ourselves when we read that scripture, is God listening to our cries right now? Is he listening to what we're saying and what we're praying about? And why in the world, if he is, isn't he doing something to all of those toilet paper holder, hoard, hoarders? I mean, after all, somebody ought to punish them, right? <laughs> um, if justice is to prevail in all of this, where is God? Interestingly enough, go back to your Bible. Go right back to the first chapter, the fifth verse, and the Lord gives an answer. This is just the beginning of a long answer to Habakkuk's particular situation. But listen to this. The Lord says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm going to do something that you wouldn't believe even if you were told. How in the world is God going to make any, any sense out of the situation that our world is in right now? How is any of this going to make any sense? We're an irreparable mess, aren't we? We're, we're just messy all over right now. <clears throat> but think about it a moment. Just wait a moment and think. Maybe, just maybe, something new and something good is going to come out of it. Do you see an increase in compassion and caring right now? whether it's online, whether it's by phone, um, all over the place. Even if you watch television, 
there's definitely an increase in compassion and caring. And while the grocery stores seem to be epicenters of panic, overall people seem to be pretty nice, saying excuse me and thank you and I'm sorry and please can I help you with that, etc., etc. Look back again at that second reading, the first chapter, the fifth verse, the Lord's answer to Habakkuk. He says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. What does God have in store with all of this? What does God have in store when all of this subsides? You know, it, it, it's, it's going to get better starting to already. Uh, What do they call it? Flattening the curve? That seems to be kind of calming down. And we're a week into it, and, and people are settling in and settling down. And so what does God have in store when all of this subsides? In our isolation, what are we doing different? Are we spending more time in prayer? Boy, I hope so. Are we spending more time studying the Word? Let's just think about that for a minute. And ask yourself, are you truly spending more time in the Word now than you did before? Are you seeking out God's will in your life? Maybe you're crying out to God because you don't know what God's will is in your life. But maybe you're crying out and saying, God, what is, what is it that you want me to do? What does all this mean to me? Where do I go with it? How do I approach it? I'm confused. I'm lost. That's exactly where God wants you because he will use you as the clay, just like the potter molds the clay. God will use you in those times of calling out, times of even the edge of despair. Are we spending more time caring about one another? Not just our family, but also our neighbors, our church family. Again, making phone calls, sending letters, whatever your form of contact is. Um, Have you thanked your mailman? (laughs) I saw a funny little thing the other day that said, everybody's worried about touching the gas pumps, but just remember, I'm a mailman and I pick up envelopes that people have licked all day long. I never thought about that. Have you thanked your mailman? Put a little put a little note in the box saying thanks for all that you do all the time. Have you um, thanked your UPS driver, your FedEx driver, whoever it is that shows up? Thank them because they are under a terrible press right now. Um, probably as bad or worse than the Christmas season, I would have to guess. Tell them thanks. Mike and I were in the grocery a few days ago, and they were stocking shelves. There was so much stuff in the aisles that you couldn't hardly get through. And there was a stocker at every pallet full of stuff. And I made special note to smile at each one because they weren't smiling very much. They looked tired, um, and they were tripping over people and didn't have anywhere to put their empty boxes. And as fast as it went on the shelf, it went off the shelf. And I made a special point to smile at everyone that I could and just say, thanks for what you're doing. Not everyone responded favorably. Some kind of nodded their head and some just went on with their work. But there were several that said, thank you for noticing. Thank you. They really appreciated that. Just made a little difference in that moment for them that day. Think back because most of you watching can remember 9-11. That's been 19 years ago, in case you've lost count. Um, We didn't think that we would ever forget. We didn't think our lives would ever be the same ever again. We didn't think things would be normal again, whatever that was. But we learned from that, that time changes things, yes? And now we have an entire generation, 19 years ago, so an entire generation and another one coming on for which 9-11 is simply something in the history books. That's it. 
That's all they know about. They've seen pictures, but they're looking in history books and they're getting someone else's opinion on what that whole situation was like. And the rest of us, we've returned to our regular routines. We might have taken time out to go into New York City and see the monuments and to consider and to pray, but overall our daily routine has gone back just to the way it was before that horrendous situation happened. The compassion and the caring and the heartbreak that happened during that 9-11 period are for most people just a faded memory, something of the past. But friends, look carefully because God is changing things again. This time he's changing it through a worldwide virus. It isn't just something that's impacting this country. This is worldwide. And many have asked over and over again if this is the beginning of the end. And I can't answer that question. I, I, I have no idea about it, even though there are a lot of indicators. If you read the Revelation, um, there's a lot of indicators that point towards end times. But truthfully, no matter what anybody says, no one knows for sure. All I can say in response to that is, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come. Take us to that promised land. Take us away from this ongoing pain of life here on this earth. So if we look at the lessons from Habakkuk, we might cry out to God just like the prophet did and ask, why, God, are you so indifferent to our needs, to our suffering? Don't you see our confusion? Don't you see our anxieties and our panic? Why, God, why? Friends, there is nothing that you or I can cry out to God that he hasn't heard before. I think I've shared with you before, I've got a little sign up near my bedroom and it says, uh, give it all to God because he'll be up all night anyway. For those nights that you lay awake with sleepless nights, that sort of thing. There's nothing that he hasn't heard before. There's nothing that he doesn't know that has happened in your life, that is happening in your life, that will happen in your life. There is nothing so in your frustrations, in your fears, in all of your emotions, just let it rip. Unload it on God. God hears every prayer and responds at exactly the right time. His right time. His perfect timing. Our job in the deal? Our job is to be still and wait for his response, to listen carefully, even if it takes a long time hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, God will answer our prayers. Look around in the Old Testament of your Bible and you'll see a lot of places where um, walls were built around the cities. You know, we we've, we've have some kids' songs related to that. Um, walls were built to keep the bad guys out and keep the good guys inside safely. And all of those walls had what they called watchtowers, where guards, essentially, people manned those and kept a lookout for people that were approaching the city, discerning whether they were good guys or bad guys, whether they were a threat, whether they were friends, what they were. And they constantly scanned the landscape looking for what was going on. There were no trees. It was flat. It was open. Uh, there were some hills. And all of a sudden, a whole army could pop over a hill, and there they would be. So walls and watchtowers were extremely important. Habakkuk was much like one of those watchers in the watchtowers, only he was in response to his prayers for God. He cried out and then he kept his eyes open and he listened and he waited 
and he watched for what God would do. Never doubting, often upset, mostly not understanding, but waiting and watching and listening for what God would do. And even though Habakkuk felt that God was being inconsistent in the situation, he also sensed the holiness of God and the holiness of God's perfect timing. He patiently, mostly, but sometimes impatiently, like we do, waited on God's response. Habakkuk could see the hopelessness of the people of Judah that he loves so much, and he could clearly see the haughtiness of the approaching uh, army and enemy, but instead of fussing and fuming and pacing in impatience, he continued to pray for the work of God to take over. What does that mean? That means he trusted God, trusted God with everything. So what's our lesson in all of this? How do we take something that was that was 600 years or more before Christ and apply it to us today? Well, first of all, the number one part of the lesson is to pray and then listen. And then when we do that, we begin to trust in God's goodness. We've got all of this spare time to dwell to crochet, to clean our oven, to fuss and fume and pace, to do things that we don't normally have time to do, to worry. But what about if we use that time to just trust in God's goodness? Why not use that time to ponder God's greatness and express to him that we trust in the good things that he's going to do. Because soon God's splendor is going to be revealed in all of this. Somehow, some way, God's splendor will be revealed. And he's going to stand in power for those who believe in him and trust him completely. God will march into victory when the timing is perfect. So until then, what do we do? We need to be a Habakkuk. In the third and last chapter of Habakkuk, the 16th verse, he says he will wait patiently on the Lord. And then in 17 and 18, he says he will rejoice in the Lord. And most importantly, in 19, he says that he will rely on the Lord. See why you need to go back and read this whole book from first through the third gigantic huge chapters today. There's a great story there, a great lesson. So I encourage you again, read all three chapters of the book. Do it while it's fresh in your mind later today, maybe tomorrow at the most. Get a great history lesson because it talks about the bigger picture of what all is going on. But most of all, see how the prophet Habakkuk grew in his trust of God. That's what we need is a lesson in trust in God, isn't it? To not worry about all of this. Somebody told me yesterday they were feeling so guilty because they have these three little dogs that yap all the time. Look out the window and yap all the time. One starts yapping, then the second one, then the third one, yap, yap, yap. Makes everybody crazy. So she loads them in the car and she takes them for a drive around whatever her block is. And she felt really guilty because she said, I, I'm supposed to be staying in the house. And I said, what? First of all, you have dogs. And if you're staying in the house all the time, you got a little problem there, if you know what I mean. I said, you know, we're supposed to be socially distant, keeping our space from one another and I guarantee you that if you had an empty pantry, you would risk it or have someone risk it to go to the grocery. You wouldn't sit around and not eat for a week or two or three. We have to use our heads in all of this. And if it means getting in the car and going for a drive and taking the dog so that they quit yapping or doing whatever, going through the drive-thru to get some ice cream, then do it. Maybe that's your mental health time. 
probably will be more and more as this draws and lingers on. But we need to, in all of that, trust God. Trust God. Grow in this, in our trust of God. Go back and look at the history lesson in this little book. It's power-packed. And when the situation seemed impossible is when God came through big time for Habakkuk and the people that he loves so dearly. And then look and see how you can apply it to your life. And then wait and see what God can and will do. Who's in control? Who is in control? Only God, my friends. Only God. Let's pray. God, we are so used to running around and doing everything we can to try to have control over our own lives, over our own destiny, over our uh, communities, our families, etc., that when things are taken out of our control, we tend to just freak out a little bit or a whole lot. But God, let's put it back in perspective and know that truly you are in control. You're the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow and forever. And if we truly believe in you and truly believe in your promise for your believers, then what do we have to worry about? Help us to go to songs and hymns that encourage us, bring us uplifting music. Help us to go to your word and dig a little deeper and find encouragement there. And Father, most of all, help us to not be afraid, but to focus on what you would have us focus on. That would be you. That would be the light at the end of the tunnel. That would be to listen for what you're saying in our lives. And whatever that call is from you, no matter how crazy it may seem, that we would have the courage to follow it and do your will. Father, we pray it in your precious and your holy name and all of God's people said, amen. Friends, it's good to spend time with you even this way. Um, I hope to do a couple more short Facebook Live messages of encouragement this week. So keep an eye out for those. And um, again, make sure you have any needs or concerns or uh, whatever to get a hold of me. Everybody knows in the world, I think, how to get a hold of me one way or the other. So I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. And until we're together again or until we talk the next time, may you feel God's blessings and love all around you, wherever you go and whatever you do. Um, take care and remember that you're loved. Bye now. <laughs>